Hello and welcome to worship this uh, th today. Uh, I'm so glad that you joined us. Again, like last week, we have a special presentation from one of our catechism students. Uh, it will be within the sermon itself, so stay tuned. That's also why the sermon is a little bit longer than what we usually see. So, uh, so sit back, relax, enjoy your coffee, uh, sit, you know, sit on the couch and uh, maybe grab some popcorn, who knows? Uh, and I hope that you uh, feel feel moved to, to serve God and God's kingdom. Uh, the gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him, from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. O Christ. And the story of Hannah, a reading from 1 Samuel. There was a certain man of Ramathaim, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was, so, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, that I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house in Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his household went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and remain there forever. I will offer him as a Nazarite for all time. 
And her husband Elkanah said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. She brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this I prayed, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. She left him there for the Lord. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full have hired them, themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and rises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the Lord are the Lord's, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries, shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Grace and peace to you, dearly beloved, from the source of love. Panina had children, but Hannah had none. What in the world could these two women have in common? A young teen, pregnant, and a young woman struggling to conceive. Uh, a betrothed and a story of a second marriage. Hannah's song follows her difficult decision. Although she promised the child to God, she had only whispered it. She delayed and hesitated to give the boy up, and her husband simply told her, it's up to you. Eva, Eli even seems oblivious to the oath when she thrusts the toddler into his arms. Now Mary, perhaps worrying about social scrutiny, traveled to stay for a time with her aunt Elizabeth. Imagine what Anna's mother must have been, or might have, have, might have said to her. Mary's mother, Anna, is known through tradition only, so we can only wonder what happened between them that delayed Mary's return. We do know that something changed in Mary before Mary returned home. We do know that something changed in Hannah before Hannah returned home. Mary and Hannah experience a change, an inevitable change, from the decisions they make. Now, it's easy to worry today, to not know what tomorrow might bring, to, to miss the obvious love unnoticed, or to miss love fading away. Uh, worry might send us fleeing or freeze us in our tracks. A four-year-old boy inside his home hears a mob shout th death threats at his mother. The political dis-ease of our nation, I worry about that. A one-year-old one boy dies of COVID-19 this week as record numbers of deaths soar. The, the social dis-ease of our nation, I worry about that. A family with a mortgage and two car payments stand in a food line this week. The financial dis-ease of our nation, I worry about that. Worry is real. It is present. Worry seems like a lack of trust in God and God's plan. God's plan seems so future, out there, not now. But here we hear Hannah sing of right now, and Mary sings of right now. Though nothing had changed them, changed in them, in fact, their intention has remained the same, something has changed. 
They sing in the present. They sing of God's presence. The hungry are full. The the full are hungry. The lowly are elevated and the leaders are set aside. The wealthy are sent away empty. The great role reversal, the, the present tense that powerfully cries out while their two kids would be change makers, both women sing of right now, of today, a change they experience in the present. God pulls us into a present future. Panina had children, but Hannah had no children. Internalized oppression causes significant emotional distress, causes difficulty trusting others, causes isolation within community. These women both experience social distress. Hannah in the expectation that she should, quote, should have children by now, and Mary in the expectation that she should not, quote, should not have children yet. Social norms often push people down and damage self-esteem. God has a normal that is far different than this. God has a normal that is in the future. God's normal breaks into our lives as it sings in the present. God's kingdom flows into the present from the future. The direction is critical, time moving differently than we experience, an overlapping of what is and what is to come. The present reality these women sing of is an expression of witnessing God's kingdom breaking into the present. They witness a reality that that the world has not yet grasped. They have seen the dream of others. They have felt the healing we all need. They have witnessed God in action. They have experienced what first went unnoticed. They experience God's love. The worry that holds us down is ripped apart by Christ pulling us into God's kingdom. Love breaks into today. The pandemic had just begun as snow was falling on the sidewalk. Boxes pile high on the steps and a table separates us. Reopened at the request of the community, a community needing a new experiment, an experiment of a grocery becoming a farmer's market. Not worship, but like communion. A meal to be shared with others, activities and education would develop partnership and love expressed. God's kingdom revealed in gratitude. God's kingdom experienced in love. God's kingdom reaching through the worry and guiding our path forward. Even as a table or a screen separate us. Now, one of our catechism students has poured over this story of Hannah this fall. She studied the characters and the plot lines, the setting and the mood. And what follows is Delaney's revamp of the Hannah saga. There once was a city on a hill. It was called Shiloh, and halfway down the hill was a town covered with gray grass and dust that built so high it looked like clouds. In the small town lived a family in a big wood house. The man of the house went by the name of Elkahan. He had two wives, Hannah and Panina. One time, the two women were in the kitchen preparing a meal. Hannah, can you please move? I need to get the wood spoon from the cabinet. Wait, I'm doing stuff here. Unlike you, I have more than just alcohol and myself to feed. With her head down, Hannah slowly walked back to the sink to clean a spoon, and speaking barely above a whisper said, Please let me know when you'll be done. Later that week, the whole family walked the long journey up the hill to the city of Shiloh. Today, alcohol is giving a sacrifice so they can eat meat and share with their God for dinner. When Hannah was given her plate, she didn't even realize that she was given more meat than Panina or any of Panina's children. And this, among all things, is what angered Panina most. But she knew that she was loved less, and instead of confronting Alcahan, Panina takes her anger out on Hannah. And Hannah always feels she isn't ever wanted. She puts so much on herself, and Panina's taunting just adds to it. So Hannah starts to go to the Lord's house. Almost every day she prays. She makes a vow to the Lord. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a male child and then 
I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. Now, as the priest Eli was observing the weeping woman, he approached her. He thought, was she drunk? Because her mouth was just moving in a silent prayer. How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? He continued, you need to put away your wine and get rest at your own home. But Hannah's response was more to the Lord than to Eli. No, my Lord, I have not drunk wine nor strong drink all night. I am but a woman of deep trouble. I have poured out my heart and soul to you, O Lord, and only have been speaking with the anxiety in my voice. With the heat of being mistaken and the good thoughts of her being gone, he steadied his voice and with an attempt of a sweet smile said, Go in peace. The God of Israel has indeed agreed to help you and go forth in your wishes. And with joy in her step, thanked Eli in the Lord for understanding. And for once in a very long time, she enjoyed herself that night. Sure enough, in due time, she bore a son. She named him Samuel and told Elkahan the story of her vow to the Lord. But when it was time for the yearly sacrifice, she was hesitant, and Panina came up to her. You should have known for the Lord to give you a child, and more importantly, a son. Did you think he would let you keep it? Once again, she felt the rush of sadness, but this time she knew what she was going to do. For your information, Panina, I told the Lord that I would give Samuel back to him, and I will. She discussed the matter with Elkahan. Do you think the Lord knew this would happen? What if I make the wrong choice? You knew this would happen, Hannah, and I'm sure the Lord did as well. If you need time with Samuel, I'm sure the Lord would want him to be weaned first. You think about it. I have to get back to work. Okay, thank you, Elkahan. As Hannah looked at her son, she thought about what Elkahan had said. She knew that God would be watching her with her son, and he will know her choice, and maybe he will understand. But as soon as Samuel was weaned, he would be offered as a Nazarite to the Lord. The day came too soon for Hannah, but she is the servant of the Lord, and she will not make him wait any longer. With Samuel in her arm, plus a young bull, an elf of flour, and wine, they walked up the, to the temple, to the house of the Lord. Once there, she said, O oh my Lord, I prayed for this child, and the Lord gave me it one. But I made the vow to give him back, and as long as he lives, he is to the Lord. And that is where she left him, left him to the Lord. Hannah was a changed person from that day forward. She knew her place in life. And God didn't just give her a son. God gave her the chance to change, to open her eyes and be grateful for all that she didn't know she had. We ground ourselves in Christ's love. Panina had children, but Hannah had none. Ritual is important. Ritual provides stability in unstable times. Young people have had rituals stripped from them for, for months, from the beginning of this 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 challenging time. Prom, graduation, summer camp, uh, sports, uh, band camp, first days of school, weddings, uh, road tripping, and the first job searches. Lost rituals have strained and pulled at the mental health of nearly half of people under 25. Hannah practices ritual. Her family travels to Shiloh to offer an annual sacrifice. The act of worship is important to them. And Hannah discovers resilience in the loss of ritual, the resilience to offer her child to the Lord. Mary is ripped from ritual. She travels away uh, to an, a strange community, finds herself in a strange place, for her friends far from her, her mother unavailable. Resilience develops to, to boldly return home to confidently cling to the Lord. Loss of ritual has started to affect others. A slinky-like effect as time catches up and descends down the stairs. 
No sitting in dark theaters for a Nutcracker Ballet, a Messiah concert, a Christmas band. Smaller or no family gatherings for feasts and questions better left unasked. Those questions, those unasked questions that often need to surface. The, like proms and graduation ceremonies, the emotional loss of holiday gatherings is stretched on a screen. The wire clings together and continues down to the next step. A frustrating present reality experienced during these intentionally, intentionally emotion-centered rituals. Many rituals have been lost, but Christ is still here. Christ breaks in from the opposite direction. Like a cat running up the stairs and dragging that slinky to the top, Christ pulls us of what binds us down. The expectations others place on us, the anxiety that grips our souls, the loss clouding our vision, it is there. It is there in those places that Christ pulls us free. We know this pain is real. It is. It stretches us. It cannot be ignored. Yet Christ is there to hold your hand, to sit with you, to, to calm you and encourage, to strengthen and motivate you have the resilience to keep moving forward. Hope is around the corner. A great reversal awaits you. An unnoticed love that beckons you to sing. Christ's love provides a meal to the hungry. Christ's love provides wealth for those in need. Christ's love provides honor for the despised. Christ reverses our fortunes even as that fortune seems lost. Christ grounds you in love, and although we worry today, Christ pulls us up from the valleys of life so that we might ground our faith in God and God's love. Amen.